notice our numbers are a little thin. It was a bit of a late finish last night at the gala dinner, but what an amazing evening that was. It's been an incredible first day for this conference. I've been remarking to a few people, we opened the day yesterday with the administrator of NASA speaking flanked by live images of uh, the dragon being grappled. We then went on at lunchtime to hear the first public presentations by Planetary Resources. And then at that amazing evening last night, honouring John Glenn and Scott Carpenter uh, with Buzz Aldrin and others in the audience in that amazing hall at the National Air and Space Museum. So it is a pretty hard uh, act to follow up after yesterday, but I can assure you that we have some fantastic presentations and panels and activities going on throughout the course of today and indeed over the next couple of days. For those of you who've uh, glanced at the program or saw how things ran yesterday, essentially in the morning we have uh, three uh, sessions or three presentations uh, that are bridged by short breaks, networking gaps. We will try to stick as close to those uh, session times as possible and what we will do is we'll hold the questions to the end of the presentation and that'll give us a bit of flexibility in terms of uh, trying to get a quick break between presentations. But you didn't come here to hear me speak, so I'd like to move on to this morning's session. And the first speaker for today has been brought to us by the great influence of Explore Mars. And I'd like to introduce Chris Carberry, who is the executive director of Explore Mars. It's a new project-oriented uh, Mars-related nonprofit. I guess you would have guessed that from the name. But uh, Chris has also been involved with NSS for a long time and he's been very active on the space scene for a long time. So I'd like to invite Chris Carberry to the stage to introduce our first speaker. Good morning, glad to see you're all awake. Last night was very exciting and the activities, the events of yesterday were extraordinary as well. So I'm glad you're able to get here this morning. Um, before I introduce our speaker this morning, I just wanted to kind of remind you, uh, you probably should have uh, pieces of paper on your seats right now. Uh, we have some additional Mars programming this afternoon, including a presentation by Dr. Mary Wojtek talking about the MSL, which you may know is landing later this year in August. Then we have a session concerning um, Mars mission architectures, and we have speakers from Aerojet, Boeing, SpaceX, and Buzz Aldrin will also be speaking on mission architecture as well, so hopefully he'll come to that. And we're rounding off that session um, with a Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter talk. So it should be a really great uh, session on Mars in the Lafayette Room, which is right over there, so hopefully he'll be able to come to that. At any rate, our speaker this morning um, is going to be talking about kind of the overall broad perspective of the Mars program with NASA, uh, has had an extraordinary career at NASA. He was the director of flight programs for NASA's Earth Science Enterprise. He's had many, many positions at NASA Goddard, spent 13 years as an F-14 uh, Tomcat pilot in the Navy, and recently has been doing a lot of writing about international collaboration and Mars exploration. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Doug McQuistian, the director of the Mars program, uh, Mars exploration program at NASA headquarters. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Well, thank you. Well, I admire your tenacity. A Saturday morning, big party last night, and you came out to listen to me, so I hope I don't disappoint. Um, you know, in the United States, Memorial uh, Day weekend is typically, you know, the, the beach weekend. It's the official start of summer for those of us who live where it gets cold in the wintertime. So I got up this morning, threw on my swimsuit and my Hawaiian shirt, and the sport coat looked a little weird with it, so I figured I'd, I'd change. But I did make it, so anyway. Um, so if we could get the slides up, please. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about uh, the program as a whole. I'm going to cover several things here. I'm going to talk about the program as a whole and how it's structured, because it is a little unique at NASA. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, what drives this. I'm going to give you an example of the science, uh, the type of science you can produce with an integrated program strategically defined. But then I'm going to spend most of my time actually on the Mars Science Laboratory. As uh, Chris said, Mary Wojtek will be here this afternoon. She's our astrobiology lead. She's the deputy program scientist for MSL, so she's going to talk about the science of MSL, and I'm going to talk about the engineering uh, of MSL. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the path that we're headed forward uh, with the program. So we're in the Science Mission Directorate and Planetary Sciences Division. 
the implementation of the missions is conducted by the, by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. So the program manager uh, is at JPL and he reports to me at NASA headquarters. The program, uh, if we'll go to the next, uh, I've got the slide clicker, excuse me. So we're a science program, we're driven by science. The main components that we're driven by is the question about life on Mars. Did it exist? Did it ever exist? Did it have the possibility to exist? The, uh, the other one is climate. We need to understand the climate. The planet was a warm, wet planet four billion years ago in its infancy. So what happened and why has the climate changed and how does that climate change? What's the climate's effect on life? Geology. All the geologists will stand up and tell you that the history of planets, whether it's this planet or any other planet, as long as it's a terrestrial planet, is embedded in the rocks. And I'll show you some uh, images it'll, and you'll understand what that means. But we understand the history of the planet through the geology. Then the fourth element that we have in the program is human exploration. While we don't do that specifically, such as Mars habitats, astronaut suits, uh, you know, human scale rovers don't fall into my purview, the measurements that the human exploration community needs to be able to figure out how to build things and how to live on the surface if the, if the soils are toxic, can they produce water, can they produce fuel, things like that on the surface, those do rest with us. The common thread through all of these is water. You may have heard that the theme for the program beginning in 2000 when this program was formed was follow the water. Well, we have followed the water, and that's the science example I'm going to walk through in just a second. We followed the water to the point that we're shifting now with Mars Science Laboratory into seeking the signs of life. We understand the water history of the planet, although every day we learn something new. From hydrothermal vents to standing water to river deltas, it's pretty incredible what we have found just in the last 10 years. How we've found this out is through a program, as I mentioned earlier, is a strategically integrated program. A whole series of missions that began back in 2001 with Odyssey, which is actually still flying, followed by uh, the MER rovers, everybody's favorite, Spirit and Opportunity, of which Opportunity is still operating on the surface eight years after its 90-day mission ended, uh, which is a little bit of over-engineering, but we won't go there. Um, so, so that's fantastic. Of course, this is where you don't really know what the planet's going to throw at you. You just don't understand it until you get there. Uh, we thought 90 days was reasonable because of the buildup of dust on the solar arrays. We had no idea that there were ways to clean the arrays on the planet. I'm going to show you one of those in a little bit, which is pretty awesome. And that's what's kept us uh, alive. Uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, we launched in 2005. High spectral resolution, you're going to hear a lot about that from Rich Zurich late today. We can image a coffee table on the surface of Mars from MRO and tell what color that coffee table is. I'll show you some amazing images of what we can do with that. Hyperspectral spectrometer, 500 plus channels. We can find minerals at, at high resolutions on the surface with that as well. And that's revolutionized our understanding of the planet. And, um, uh, and Phoenix, short-lived Martian Arctic, really cool. Show you some pictures there too. We learned a lot about water and, and some other things from that. And then Mars Science Lab is coming up, I'll talk about it. MAVEN is the next one in the queue in 2013. It's being built right now out of Lockheed Martin. It's what's called an aronomy mission. One of the points of climate is what happened to the climate at Mars? Why is it thin now? Why, where did the water go and what happened? Part of the key here is to understand the escape rates uh, of the atmosphere. The solar wind is driving the atmosphere of Mars away all the time and this mission is going to go try to understand the constituents of the atmosphere and what those escape rates are and try to reverse engineer essentially what the climate used to be. Very important missions. These are all uh, underlaid by several different keys. We do strategic missions, we do competitive selected missions as you can see there. We, we have a constant technology program that runs that feeds all these missions with new capabilities and I'll show you a little bit about that. And we have a, a fantastic education and outreach program. We have uh, hundreds of museums in a museum alliance. We have programs for kids. We do curriculum for teachers. Um, we, we do things such as uh, uh, focus studies with some of the uh, American Indian tribes out in the West and, and actually go on to the reservations and do work with them and try to excite them in, in planetary sciences, geology, and geochemistry and things. And it's very successful. Not only do these missions do science, but these missions actually are all interconnected with each other strategically. So one mission will inform us from orbit where we should go on the ground, such as Odyssey did uh, help us figure out where to go with uh, the MER rovers because we saw some water signatures we wanted to follow up on and get ground truth. 
all of the surface missions do their data relay through the orbiters. So it's kind of like the telecom birds that sit here over the U.S. that, boom, that do everything from telephones to, uh, to TV signals and your GPS, if you will. Um, so, so all these guys are all interrelated. So that infrastructure is something that's absolutely crucial to keep this going. Where will MSL take us? What's next after MSL? We'll find out when MSL gets on the surface. But these are the kind of capabilities that once you have them, it's tough to give them up. And uh, if you don't have them, your science is very, very limited. So I'm going to give you an example, just one example of the kind of science that you see um, and, and that we get from, uh, from a program that's integrated like this. This is a, uh, this is a hydrogen map, basically. The, the, I don't know if this uh, will this work. Let's see. This is essentially, a, it's kind of weak if you can see this. Hopefully you can. This is a hydrogen map from Odyssey, uh, and it shows you the blue is essentially large volumes of hydrogen. So this is at the poles of the planet. You would sort of expect that. There's some areas where there's also hydrogen, and hydrogen obviously is a major component of water, and so this gives you ideas of where the signatures of water are. If you look at this lower set of images, which uh, this is uh, mapping done by MER, but this is the important and interesting one for this discussion. This is actually a radar cross-section by an instrument on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that actually shows you a cross, oh, sorry, wrong button. This shows you a cross-section of the polar cap, the northern polar cap. This is kilometers of water ice in the northern pole of Mars. So we have an amazing water cycle that we've discovered that we didn't understand before, and, and the polar caps actually are a major driver in that. This is Phoenix. Some of the interesting things with Phoenix, if, if you, uh, the MER rovers were different. They landed, they bounced along in airbags, and then they drove off the platform and did their thing. Phoenix was a fixed lander. It had no wheels on it, but the engines were underneath it for landing. So it was a soft lander, and when it landed, you can see these are the lander legs of Phoenix. Um, and again, this is the Martian Arctic. This is up kind of in the equivalent of Alaska in the U.S., we landed in the summer, uh, and the Martian summers are fairly short, so actually uh, Phoenix uh, succumbed to winter. It got covered in ice and, uh, and obviously didn't survive that. But what's right below all this, what's appears to be permafrost, are these areas that are actually ice. So a few centimeters below the dust and dirt in the Arctic is a sheet of ice. It's a layer of ice that we don't know how thick it is, but, uh, but you can get some ideas from the radar images I showed you previously. Another really interesting is down in this left-hand corner picture. These are lander legs, and if you look at where this arrow is pointing, you see droplets of what look like water. Well, water can't survive on the surface considering the atmospheric pressures on Mars currently. But heavily brined water, very heavy in salts, um, actually can. And so this was the first hypothesis of brines being able to survive on the surface of Mars as these droplets actually formed and, uh, and then dissipated over time. And then this is actually a trench that, uh, that Phoenix dug, and you can see the ice in here over time actually sublimated away. One more, another couple of pieces of this water story. So we see all kinds of water features now. So this looks, looks like the, uh, the River Nile uh, Delta, right, or the Mississippi River Delta. This is Eberswalde, uh, this is Eberswalde Delta, which is, um, which actually looks exactly like an outflow channel on Mars. So flowing water from this, areas like this where we have standing water, evidence of that over years and years, gullies that sometimes gullies are formed by wind and erosion, but water, water forms gullies, obviously, as well. And then you have things like this in the center. These little guys are called blueberries. Spirit found these, Opportunity found these. They're all over the place. It's called hematite. It's an iron nodule formed only in standing water, when water stands for extremely long periods of time and it actually concretes around small elements and, and that's what you get. And there's millions of these all over the surface. Probably had something to do with the hydrogen signatures we saw from orbit from Odyssey. And then this is a very recent discovery, um, probably six, eight months ago, right before Martian winter. This is a line of gypsum that um, Opportunity found when it's exploring Endeavour Crater. Gypsum in straight lines like this form as water wells up in cracks uh, between rocks and then solidifies as the, uh, as, and deposits and as the water evaporates or sublimates, whichever, in those days, it leaves almost pure gypsum behind. Pretty incredible find. Now this one is interesting. I hope, I hope it's running. Yes, if you look carefully at this, 
If you look carefully at this uh, picture on the right, this is from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we have found seasonal flows of briny water on the surface of Mars, not in one place, but in tens of places in latitudes similar to the Washington DC area, actually. And this is, this is the high point uh, at the top of a crater wall, and you see this is downslope. And as you watch, you'll see in the spring, you can see these dark lines forming. That's, that's briny waters, we believe, that are coming up out of the rock as the season warms. This is sun, sunward facing slopes of these craters and running down. Uh, it's not like a swimming pool full of water, but it's, it's, it's at least enough to get the soil moist that you can actually see this. Th this, is, this is proof there's actually a current water cycle on Mars. Pretty amazing discovery. Hubble Space Telescope, this is another interesting one. This is a cycle of the northern polar region, I believe it's northern, northern polar region over time, and not that much time. You can see how the ice caps grow and shrink with the seasons. So, uh, you know, the similarities to Earth continue to grow. As we, as we study Mars, it becomes more and more Earth-like in many ways scientifically and becomes much more intriguing, much more intriguing. I'm sorry, this is actually southern, uh, this is the southern polar CO2 ice buildup. Um, and what's important on this one is, uh, this is the water ice cap that's pretty much permanent, that uh, we have similar cross-sections to what I showed you previously on the northern pole. Other things orbiters can do. I mentioned that they can resolve very small things on the surface. We use them, uh, MRO specifically, to find landing sites. Phoenix, actually, the first landing site we selected for Phoenix, uh, we thought was a great looking landing site. We had four different sites around the northern Arctic that we wanted to go to. The one we picked when we started taking images with high rise down at 30 centimeter, 60 centimeter resolution was full of boulders. Uh, Phoenix likely would have hit a boulder and would not have been a successful landing. So we changed the landing site. Um, what's cool here is these actually are pictures from Mars Reconnaissance over Orbiter flying overhead at about 400 kilometers. And you can actually see Phoenix on the surface. You can see the parachute and, uh, and the back shell here, and you can, you can see the, uh, a number of different features here. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. We imaged Phoenix after, the, after Martian winter went away, and we actually took pictures of Phoenix, and, and we understood why it didn't survive the winter, because the arrays had broken off and were laying on the ground. So you can even tell that. So it's an amazing tool um, to figure out what you have, where you want to go, and what you want to do. So hopefully this runs. I mentioned to you that we had cleaning events. We had a way to clean the solar arrays. Uh, this is not marching across. I'm um, sorry about that, but this is an image or a series of images from uh, Spirit, I believe, that were taken. This little guy is a dust devil. So this is a small tornado on the surface of Mars that in many areas um, in the summer occur, especially in spring as the seasons change and the, and, the, and the climate, the weather actually changes, and they march across the surface and what we find is that they go over the rovers and uh, clean the solar arrays off, take all the dust off. Absolutely incredible, we never knew these existed. We used to see, and these are from, uh, these are tracks, these two lower pictures are tracks um, taken by MRO, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, of those dust devils that go across the surface. We've seen these dark lines that show up and then disappear as the dust covers them up uh, in the wintertime, and we didn't know what they were. They're caused by these dust devils, which is pretty cool. So I talked about technology as well. This is a, a single example of the kinds of technology that a strategic program can bring you. Down at the bottom in the center, which you can almost barely see, this little guy down here is the Sojourner rover, right? Late 1990s technology, the size of a toaster oven. One instrument aboard, kilogram of instrumentation, and that was it, right? It wasn't but a few years later, less than a half a decade, that we landed two MERs. We have now gone from essentially one instrument to five, and a multiplication factor of about three on the mass of those instruments. The roving distance has gone up significantly. Instead of a few meters, uh, we have a few hundred meters. And now where we are is we've moved to the next generation, which is MSL, which is what you see on the right-hand side. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you more about MSL starting with the next slide. But this is a huge leap in technology. We are now, go we've gone from 175 kilograms for Spirit and Opportunity to 950 kilograms for MSL. It is carrying a small scientific laboratory inside. Instead of simply having contact instruments and being able to look at things, we will actually be chemically processing uh, samples from Mars with gas chromatographs and, and mass spectrometers. Absolutely un un 
unbelievable. Ten years ago, we'd have never thought we could do this. It's been a challenge, but we've gotten there. Another thing is landing. To get to the really exciting places, you have to land near them because you can't drive forever. It's, uh, it's much tougher driving on Mars when you're you know, seven minutes away with a radio signal than it is uh, otherwise. So, so we've shrunk the landing error ellipse from about 50 kilometers to about 20 kilometers, and we're still in the process of shrinking it further so we can get into areas we could never get into before. So let's talk about Curiosity a little bit. Uh, we launched on the Saturday after Thanksgiving. We will land on August 5th of uh, this year, this summer, about uh, 1 a.m. East Coast time. And uh, as the project manager says, we will land. The only question is, how fast will we be going? <laughs> I don't like him saying that, but it doesn't, doesn't really help much. But, uh, so I'll show you why in a second here. So the way the mission works, as I said, we launched this. Uh, the, in the top left, you'll see essentially what looks like an Apollo capsule, but it's actually the MSL uh, capsule that has the rover inside of it, it has the descent stage inside it, and it has a cruise stage. That round thing at the top is the cruise stage. It has a heat shield just like an Apollo capsule, it has a heat shield, um, except this is actually larger. This is four and a half meters in diameter, so it is, it is a monster. The way this, uh, so we spent eight and a half months in cruise. We're about uh, 73 days from landing right now, so we're well more than halfway through cruise. Um, and as we get to the top, I'm going to go through the whole sequence in a minute, but uh, we get to the top of the atmosphere, and from the top of the atmosphere to on the ground is about seven minutes. All robotic, all automated, pretty impressive. Um, when we get to the surface, we'll have 20 kilometers of drive distance capability. We'll have uh, two years, two Earth years. A Mars year is essentially two Earth years, so you've got to be careful with what years you're talking about. Um, two Earth years of time on it is the plan. Um, and what's interesting is we have a, a radioisotope thermal generator as a power source, no solar arrays. So we have about four kilograms of plutonium that create heat, and from that waste heat, we actually create electricity that charges the batteries. So we don't have a power limitation. We don't have to worry about um, uh, solar array cleaning events either. This is what the rover looks like. Um, Mary Wojtek this afternoon will actually go through all these instruments and what they do. But just a, a, a brief overview of this, uh, this vehicle stands uh, a little over six feet tall. Uh, like I said, it weighs about a metric ton. Uh, we have uh, nine to ten instruments aboard, depending on how you want to count them, coming from multiple countries. The Spanish have provided a meteorological package. Uh, the Russians have provided a hydrogen measuring package. Uh, the French are part of the uh, gas chromatograph mass spectrometer series called SAM. Uh, so it's a very international mission in that regard. Now some real pictures. This is actually the rover right before it was packaged up and shipped to the launch base. You can see uh, the wheels, the mast, uh, and all those items. You can see on, now well, there's a better picture in a minute. This gives you an idea of the size of it. You see the technician on the right hand side. This is right before the thermal vac chamber test where we bring, the ch we put the vehicle in a chamber, we bring the temperatures down and the pressure down to simulate Mars uh, and run, run it through its paces to make sure that everything works. Uh, what you're looking at here in the back, this big white thing, is that radioisotope thermal generator that I mentioned to you. And you'll also notice that on the outsides there is what look like cooling loops, and that's because they are cooling loops. So we take heat off of that and we run it through a fluid system just like your car does inside to keep all the avionics warm as well. This is what the inside looks like. It is crammed full of hardware. Um, at the bottom right is the, uh, the SAM instrument, sample analysis at Mars. Like I said, that used to be essentially when we started this project, that was a rack of equipment in a guy's laboratory. Stood six, eight feet tall, a couple of racks wide, about three to five feet wide. We have designed this down, crammed it down into a box that fits inside the rover. It'll do uh, 74 samples and, uh, and test them all for us. And that's it uh, inside the rover right there. And, and it's, it's a very densely packed unit. This is a, a folded up view of it, again, just uh, so you can kind of see how the wheels now are wrapped for planetary protection. What does that mean? Um, we try to protect the planet at Mars, just like if we were bringing things back from Mars, we try to protect this planet. We don't want to take biological things with us that could contaminate the planet. Um, why? Well, number one, we don't know what could or could not grow there, so we don't want to leave anything behind. 
Uh, but secondarily, we're doing measurements for organics as well. We don't want to measure organics that we brought with us either. So uh, very strict adherence to planetary protection requirements. And so those wheels don't get unwrapped until right before we close the clamshell on the launch vehicle. So the whole thing is, uh, not the whole thing, but large portions of this, anything that touches the surface is actually completely sterilized before it's built and then protected until we uh, actually launch. This is the descent stage. So what happens, and I'm going to show you how this builds up, this is essentially a rocket-powered helicopter, eight big engines that you can see sticking out here. Um, and the rover goes up underneath this. So this is actually going to hover and then crane the rover down to the surface and then fly away instead of airbags, instead of bouncing along the surface. It's kind of hard to see the rover in here, but this is the rover mated to the descent stage. You can see one wheel right here in front. Um, and this other big thing that's sticking out in the front is actually the landing radar. So obviously we need to know how far above the surface we are and how fast we're going, both horizontally and vertically, and that's what that does for us. So this kind of develops like a Russian doll where the rover goes into the descent stage and then the descent stage is going to go into the back shell. Okay, now, now things are looking more familiar probably as, as we move into things that might look like a, a, an Apollo capsule and the familiarity with that. This is the whole assembly. That's the bottom of the rover, the big white thing. The whole thing's stuffed into the back shell. So it's a pretty tight fit. And, and there is, I believe, yeah, to give you a sense of scale, right there on the bottom is a technician. Give you an idea how big this thing is. This is the complete flight unit assembled. This guy up at the top, this round thing is the cruise stage. You're going to need to know that in just a second because the top of that is full of solar panels. That would keep, that's what keeps us alive in the cruise to Mars. So it produces all the power. It does all the uh, directional navigation control for us. It has its own, excuse me, its own propulsion system in it. And that's what gets us to Mars. And we dump that right before we land. One more, uh, another sense of scale for you here. Down here at the bottom is that whole assembly I just showed you, and you saw the relationship to the, uh, to the technician. This is the, these two big tall vertical things actually are the clamshell fairing of the Atlas V. So give you an idea of how large that is as well. So we are a little drop in the bucket, if you will, even though we're pretty darn big, we're a drop in the bucket in, inside this Atlas V fairing. So we launched on uh, November 26th, and the reason you needed to remember cruise stage is what you see in the bottom right is actually the solar arrays of the cruise stage. This was taken, this image was taken, we have a whole sequence of these. You can go online to uh, the Mars website, go to MSL, and you can actually watch a video of this, where the rocket actually, the Atlas V actually has a camera, forward-looking camera on it, and you can watch us spin up the cruise stage, and the cruise stage uh, is then disengaged from the... Uh, from the upper stage, the Centaur upper stage, and actually is on its way to Mars. And so that's what you're looking at, which is pretty cool. So where are we going? We're going to Gale Crater. Uh, we had four landing sites we could choose from, and those are the white ones. The uh, yellow ones are places we've landed before. Down in the bottom right is Gale Crater. This is uh, about a 90 kilometer across uh, crater with a three mile high mountain in the middle of it. Uh, this is an unbelievable uh, scientific treasure trove, we believe. And, and again, Mary will go into this in detail. But the reasons we want to go, oh, let me say this first, that round white circle in the center is the size of our landing error ellipse, okay? So we will land somewhere in there, but not sure exactly where. So you have to find a safe place, figure out where that's going to be, and that's how it's set up. But you can see the red lines that come from the top left of the screen actually come from the outside walls of the crater, and it looks like a river flow uh, that comes down and drops and creates this big alluvial fan, which is basically like a delta area. That's what the purple and the blue lines are. Which is, and there's all these clay materials that we see. That's the green. Uh, the center of that, uh, the right-hand side of that picture actually is the beginning of the mountain. We want to drive up the mountain if we can over the years to see what we can find. There's all kinds of terrain in here and materials that we don't even know what they are. Um, some of this cemented fractured terrain, which is that funny white stuff, we don't know what that is. So we want to go figure it out. Now, what makes this, ah, EDL, sorry. Okay, so how do we get there? That's the real question. Um, how do we get to the surface? Well, it sounds like it was pretty easy, but in reality, um, it's very, very difficult. We, um, we go through a sequence of undressing or un unwrapping the thing that I just showed you is all wrapped up. Uh, again, the light time, the radio communications time to Mars is about seven minutes. This whole sequence takes about seven minutes. 
So uh, we are out of the loop. When we hit the top of the atmosphere, it is on its own and it does its own thing. So I'll walk you through this briefly because I'm going to close with a video in a little bit uh, that will take you through an animation of this that's actually pretty cool. So we hit the top of the atmosphere at the top left there at about 12 to 13,000 miles an hour. By the time we get down to this area here and through the peak, heat, peak heating and the peak deceleration, we've gone from about 12,000 miles an hour down to a Mach 2. That's in about four minutes. So we then pop the parachute at about Mach 2, and, and again, in a couple of minutes, about three minutes, we actually slow from Mach 2 down to about 125 miles an hour, which is where we start dropping heat shields off, we start dropping, uh, eventually we, uh, we then drop the, uh, the descent stage, it still has a rover tucked up underneath it. We drop that out of the back shell, and the engines start. Uh, what the descent stage then does is take the remaining 125, 120 miles an hour out of the speed and, and then um, reorients perfectly vertically, right? And then when it slows to a point where it's about 60 feet above the ground, about 20 meters above the ground, with as close to zero horizontal and vertical velocity as possible, it actually rolls down the uh, rover on a set of cables. So the rover will get to the ground and the brains, the computers are all in the rover, so the descent stage actually doesn't have any smarts in it. So the rover decides when it's actually on the ground um, and then it cuts the cables and the descent stage flies away, open loop, and isn't used again. Again, this whole sequence is automated. The difficult part about this is you can't test this on Earth. So this is a challenge. You can test pieces of this on Earth, but you can't test this end to end. You don't have the atmospheric pressures, you don't have the densities, and, and you don't have the temperatures, you don't have the dust effects. The Mars atmosphere is full of dust, and they have big dust storms like we have hurricane seasons, they have dust storm seasons. So there's a lot of variables uh, that make it actually quite challenging. So I talked briefly, and I'm just going to show you this real quickly. Um, this is the MSL landing error ellipse I just showed you. We'll land in that black circle somewhere in Gale Crater. And the reason we can get there and go to these scientific sites is this is the landing error ellipse for spirit and opportunity. So there's no way we can go to places like this. We couldn't get into Eberswalde Crater. We couldn't get in to Marth Vallis. We couldn't get in to any of the really, really stunning scientific locations. And when we get to humans to Mars, you don't want your cargo landed 20 or 30 kilometers away from your crew. So as we learn how to shrink these landing error ellipses, we will go from from ballistic to precision landing to high proximity landings to pinpoint landings where we can get systems within hundreds of meters of other systems and we're slowly working our way towards that, but very important. So I mentioned that it was hard. Um, this is a global head count, if you will. The Russians have gone, the Europeans have gone, uh, we've gone, but you know, our success rate is really actually rather poor. Mars usually wins this battle. Uh, orbiters were more successful. About 50% of the orbiters ever launched to Mars have actually made it and made it into orbit. But only about 35% of the landers have actually ever made it to the ground successfully. So uh, this, is a, this is a pretty challenging thing to do here, pretty challenging thing. So I'm going to move on into the future for a second. Um, skipping over MAVEN, I talked about MAVEN briefly. Um, but as folks might be aware, um, we have some budget challenges that we were handed this year in the President's budget. Um, there's a lot of rumor out there that uh, the program is dead and that's by, you know, the, the, the rumors of my demise are uh, premature here. <laughs> we actually uh, are going to skip the 2016 opportunity. I should say this first. Mars actually has a cycle every 26 months uh, of proximity that it, it's the most efficient way to get to Mars about every 26 months. So about every two years, roughly, you can think about that. So we're going to launch in, in uh, we launched in 11, we'll launch in 13. Uh, that little extra two months makes us, the next launch opportunity is 16, and then the next opportunity is 18. So we're going to skip 16 uh, because of the funding situation, but we're going to pick it back up in either 18 or 20. And so there's a team that we put together at the agency level, uh, run actually by my predecessor in this program, um, and he's taking a look at what kind of opportunities and, and what the right mission sets are. We're considering orbiters, we're considering landers, but the most interesting element of this is um, the agencies decided the right thing to do is to try to get a closer tie and uh, expand our cooperation with the human exploration organizations. Now, we, we did this in the 2006-2007 timeframe, so we've got a lot of material to work with. Uh, and, and as I said early in this, 
we, uh, we can help them with measurements. We can understand the proximity of, uh, of water to where humans might go. Uh, we can understand uh, and do tests to understand how well and how easily we can produce water and fuel and oxygen out of the materials that exist on the planet. We can help with how toxic is the soil and what things are dangerous. We can, another one is the dust itself. Um, and Buzz can talk to you about what the dust was like on the moon. I don't think it was what we really expected. Um, and I think that may be the case with Mars as well. Uh, so we can do a lot of analysis of what the dust is like and, and build systems and help the human organizations, human spaceflight organizations, build systems that, uh, that can uh, function under those different kinds of dust capabilities and dust loads. The president also challenged us in a speech a couple of years ago um, to try to get humans into the Mars vicinity in the 2030s. Um, there are cycles on top of cycles. I mentioned the two-year cycle. Another cycle makes 2033 the best opportunity in the 2030s to get large-scale systems, whether they're things like MSL or human-scale systems, to the planet. Uh, and so that's one that we're looking at and, and trying to target uh, the future architectural work um, around that opportunity. And of course, then the National Academy of Sciences every 10 years helps us with ways we should go forward uh, with the most important science challenges. And so we've, uh, we are tying that into this as well. So I'm not going to go into much detail because this is all very formative and in formulation right now. But, uh, but the key here is that we are building on four new pathways that the team has come up with. Um, and very briefly, uh, the first one is essentially a direct response to the uh, National Academy's recommendation to go return samples from Mars as quickly as we can. So that's jumping right into that pathway. That's an expensive pathway. We don't know that we can afford that at this point and, and probably can't, at least right now. The second pathway is expand your work on the surface. The science is on the surface, in my opinion. So put more systems on the surface, understand it better, make sure you know where you're going to go to get those samples before you actually do the sample return mission. The third one is, well, what happens? And the third one is actually, let me do the fourth one first. The fourth one is MSO gets there and it discovers a dinosaur bone, right? Well, if we find, if we get a dinosaur bone, I don't have a budget problem, we're on pathway one and we're bringing it back, right? <laughs> so I don't think that'll be a question. But what if MSO lands and we determine that everything we thought we were gonna find at Gale Crater from all the reconnaissance we've done isn't at all what we expected. You know, what if those clays really aren't clays? What if that cemented terrain is nothing but volcanic lava flows and things? What if it just isn't what we expected? That's where pathway C comes in. Okay, we, we're, we got it wrong. We don't understand the planet as well as we thought we understood the planet. Let's go back and look at the planet as a system, which is exactly what Earth science does with the Earth. Climate, water, tropical rainfall, hurricanes, uh, geology, biology. Uh, we need to go back and relook at what we're doing with Mars and rethink this, and that's pathway C. If you guys want to follow along, there's a couple of great websites. You can keep track of how this work is going. The work actually, the, this, this team I mentioned that we put together, the Mars Program Planning Group, actually only exists until uh, August of this year when they provide a final report to me and the agency and basically say, here's what we think the best options and best ideas are, not just for the 1820 time frame, but for the longer term on these pathways, what the longer term mission sets ought to look like through roughly 2030. They have their own website. That's the address down at the bottom right. I'm sorry, that's at the top left, my mistake. Um, at the bottom right, actually, is a workshop website. And we have a workshop in June. It's going to be live streamed and it's going to be WebExed. So if you want to just dial in, watch the view graphs go by, and listen to the proceedings, you can do that. What this is about is we've, we've called for ideas. We put a public call out and said, everybody who wants to give us ideas on what we ought to be doing, whether it's a technology or whether it's actually a mission type, let us know. And so a workshop down at the Lunar Planetary Institute in June is where we're going to sift through um, the most promising of those and have the authors of those papers come in and talk to us. We've got about 400 new ideas, uh, which is pretty incredible, of which I think about half of those uh, we're going to probably deal with in that workshop. And you can follow that workshop, and that is the bottom right slide. So that's kind of the path forward. It's a little fuzzy right now, but, uh, but that's okay. All of these things are a little fuzzy as you start developing them, and as you get closer, you start uh, defining the missions themselves, and you keep going. But right now, it's a healthy program. MSL is my top priority. We're going to get that guy, as I said, to the ground at some velocity uh, in, in August. 
Uh, Maven follows that, and uh, frankly, a, a two-year hiatus missing the 16 opportunity isn't that big a deal. So the program actually is quite healthy and doing well. Uh, we're continuing the reformulation. We're going to tie in the decadal, uh, the National Academy's decadal survey re responsibilities, as well as tying in greater technology and greater human exploration capabilities. And we're still reaching out to the internationals. We had a joint program going with the Europeans. Because of the budget changes, we had to abandon that. But uh, we have a large European uh, presence actually coming to the workshop. So that'll be exciting. And there's ways that they would like to continue to work with us. And obviously, we would like to work with them. Returning samples from Mars, which is definitely uh, a doable within the next 10 to 20 years, is an international endeavor. Not just financially, but the things that we may find, the things we may bring back, I believe, could have profound effects uh, on our view of life uh, on this planet. And so I think it really deserves an international attention, an international focus. So we're headed that way. So that's my last word chart. Sorry about the word charts. I'm from NASA. We're required to do word charts. Um, and I'm going to leave you with a video. This video is really pretty cool. You guys can go ahead and cue it up. Um, this video is pretty cool. This is an animation of what I just talked about on that EDL timeline. So I won't walk you through this because I kind of walked you through it before until we actually get it on the surface. Then it's a short video. Then there's a couple of things I'll just mention. And if you come to Mary's talk this afternoon, you'll hear more about that. So would you run the video, please? I have a question. Yeah, we got one in the okay. front here. Let me grab him and then I'll grab you. If we have a mic floating around. Ah, great. Yes, sir. On your list of priorities of possible missions, uh, where does a mission to uh, Phobos or Deimos rank, given the uh, failed Russian sample return mission Phobos Grunt? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, that's obviously high on the Russians' priority list. Um, our science community actually hasn't rated Phobos and Deimos as high uh, on the list scientifically is actually landing on the surface of Mars itself. So right now, it, it, it's, we'll find out if this changes in the workshop, but, uh, but I don't really expect it from a scientific perspective. I don't expect it to change. The science is on the surface. We need to understand the, the water history and the potential for life on the planet, which probably isn't going to uh, translate to the, to the moons of Mars. And so right now, it's pretty low on the scientific list. Yes, yes. Uh, if uh, Curiosity or some follow-up missions should actually detect current life on Mars, do you think that would spur or would basically inhibit and block uh, human exploration of Mars? The uh, Curiosity rover won't be able to, unless it sees a salamander or something running around, won't actually be able to detect life. Uh, we tried that with Viking, and that was a bit of a challenge. No, you know, but that's why I said, or future missions. The oh, future question missions. Is, the I'm question sorry. is, do you think that would hurry up the day we'll send people to Mars to follow up, or do you think that will slow down the day because of peop people worrying about contaminating and destroying what original indigenous life there is? I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. Um, uh, my personal opinion is it should accelerate our interest in getting humans to the planet. 
Um, finding life on another planet is, is amazing. It's a, it would be a huge change in paradigms for us. And uh, as long as we can prove that we can bring it back safely, which is what that whole planetary protection thing is about, um, I think we would want to get it back here and be able to apply not just the laboratories on Earth, but the brains on Earth to uh, understanding mm -hmm. it and studying it. So I would hope mm -hmm. that it would actually spur interest in returning them. I guess I still have not really expressed my, my question properly. The concern is that people on Earth would be worried that Earth life on Mars would contaminate and destroy the Martian life, which is obviously very fragile, and therefore they would say, don't go, we have no right to do that. And I was wondering whether you think that might be an operative political factor if, you've, if we found uh, life. It, it's certainly possible. Um, every launch, every nuclear launch we have, whether it's Cassini or MSL or even MER, uh, you know, spirit and opportunity. There are many people who think we shouldn't be launching nuclear systems yes. into space. So there certainly will, will be that voice and that opinion. Um, what the larger scale global opinion is, uh, is a little hard to predict. I would hope that they would want us to bring some of it back, or at a minimum, send humans there to study it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, um, I have a few questions, so I answer as many as, as you'd like. Um, first of all, I know that, that that video that you just showed was just an artist's representation, right. but will the uh, Sky Queen be launching its rockets that quickly after being released from the aero shell? And if so, are you guys worried about it colliding uh, with, with the aero shell? Ah, that's a good question. Actually, the, um, no, it, it, there's a couple of minutes separation in there, um, and we actually turn the radar on before it ever comes out of the back shell. And usually we can find, and this is all automated, but usually you can find the back shell in the radar signature. And so you understand where it is. Um, you're also not going vertically at this point. You actually have a, a launch. So the way this glide path works is unlike MER and all the Phoenix and the others that were completely ballistic, we actually fly this in and then you saw the, the, the jets at the back, right, the thrusters. So we actually then flatten out and drive parallel to the surface for a while. And then when we pick up the trajectory again and the heat shield comes off, we're actually not going straight down. So it's going to fall away and we're going to go down range. So that's the other piece. But we look for it. We do look for it. All right, and then I have a quick question and then a possibly difficult question. Who do we have to thank or blame, depending on your opinion, for the whole concept of the sky crane? <laughs> and Who do we have to thank for it? <laughs> um, you know, there, there's an entry descent and landing team that uh, is centered at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And, uh, and there are elements of that at Ames Research Center and elements at Langley Research Center that all do different pieces of this. But there are a number of folks from the Viking era that are still around and they still advise us. And uh, the way they like to explain it to me, the first time I saw it, I thought they were nuts. Um, but, but when you think about it, it's like taking Viking and just putting the engines on top. Because the whole bridal assembly is, is basically the same bridal assembly we had with Spirit and Opportunity, because when it came out of the back shell, it rolled, it, it unraveled itself down and held on a tether, and then the airbags inflated before we cut it loose. So the concept really came out of the EDL group and the Viking folks that were on that group. Say, hey, why don't you put the motors on top? Interesting. All right, well, my last question yeah. is, I know that we're trying to be very, very careful about not contaminating the surface of Mars, but is there any soil, especially in the northern or southern hemispheres, that we could potentially grow um, uh, herb-like plants uh, on to actually uh, get the process of, yeah. of, of starting to produce oxygen in the atmosphere? You know, I, I'm going to use that as a plug to come back and talk to Mary Wojtek. Uh, she's a scientist. I am not. She's uh, our astrobiology lead at NASA, and uh, she would be the right one to ask that question to. I don't know the answer to that. Thank you for answering my questions. Back microphone. Uh, hi. I, I hate to do this, but I'm just fascinated by the sky crane thing. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about the, the justifications of using this thing and what the advantages are and how the uh, decision came about to use this? And secondly, sure. I'm a little bit curious about um, the international efforts uh, given that there are going to be a variety of countries and organizations that are interested in going to Mars, I'm wondering how uh, uh, you're going to avoid duplication of efforts. Okay. Um, the second one I couldn't quite hear too well, so let me hit the first one, and then you can hit, give me the second one again. Um, the sky crane is, is a pretty innovative technique. The key here was the science we wanted to do with the Mars Science Laboratory and the Curiosity rover uh, couldn't be packaged, obviously, on something as small as a Mars exploration rover, a spirit and opportunity kind of rover. Um, and as soon as you start growing 
the number of instruments and the mass of those instruments and the volume of those instruments grow, obviously the rover does as well. And frankly, the rover is sized to support the instrument suite. Um, you very quickly get out of the mass capability of airbags. So um, Spirit and Opportunity were about 175 kilograms total. Uh, the landed mass, I should give you, which is, which is closer to about 400 kilograms with the platform and the airbag system and all. As soon as you get above that, by maybe 50 to 100 kilograms, you can't use airbags anymore, or at least we haven't figured out how. So you have to have some other landing system. So you can either put the engines on, land like Viking, and drive off of a platform, which has its own difficulties with slopes uh, and with rocks, because fixed-legged landers don't like slopes and rocks very well. Um, and so we decided, why don't we land on the wheels? And the reason you land on the wheels is to handle that. We can land on a 20 degree slope. Uh, those rocker bogey systems will allow the wheels to go in many different positions such that we can land on a meter high boulder uh, with one of the wheels and it doesn't have any effect on the, uh, on the, on the rover itself. Uh, so you don't have the problems of getting off of a platform or where you're landing. So it really gives us greater capability, even within that smaller ellipse, uh, there's still little things that can bite you in there, so, it's, it, so it was a good technique, not just from a mass perspective, because we had to go somewhere else than airbags, and secondarily from landing robustness perspective. And, and I'm sorry, I just, the speaker's not that good. I couldn't hear your second question too well. The uh, second question was just about the international efforts. Uh, given that there are a whole bunch of different countries that are hoping to send something to Mars, I'm just wondering what, uh, what you're doing to avoid duplication of effort, that kind of thing. Ah. Um, actually, we have a, a working group. Um, and, and my counterpart and I chair. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about what they're doing and what we're doing uh, so that we don't duplicate effort. We actually um, share instruments in many cases. Um, uh, they provide us, like I mentioned on MSL, they provide us a lot of instruments, whether it comes from ESA or independent countries. Uh, Spirit and Opportunity actually had Canadian instruments aboard, and, and actually I forgot to mention them, and I should have. The Canadians have an instrument on board uh, MSL as well. So we're constantly in dialogue. Um, I talk to my European colleagues at least weekly, uh, and we have more formal meetings every couple of months. So we, we stay pretty well connected, and we look at complementary things. I, I mentioned a good example is Relay. I mentioned that all the ground assets data goes through the orbiters. The Europeans are uh, working with the Russians to launch an orbiter in 2016. I'm providing radio gear to them, to, uh, which is a software reprogrammable radio that we've started using on MSL and MRO um, to provide a lot more flexibility and a lot more bandwidth uh, for MSL communications through MRO back to Earth. So I'm giving them a set of those radios for their 16 mission so that when MSL, if it's still alive, can use their orbiter as well as the orbiters we have. And they're talking about a lander in 18, uh, and they'll use the same system. So we're, we're standardizing that infrastructure. So there's a lot of cooperation. Yes, sir. Okay, a few questions. What is the maximum range of the, of the Curiosity once it lands uh, at its site and the creator? Um, th this is a tough question because, uh, because of what MER has done to us. <laughs> uh, it was designed for 600 meters and we've driven uh, 11 kilometers now with, with opportunity. So the design for MSL is 20 kilometers. We've built it, designed it, and tested it to 20 kilometers. Uh, what it will really give us over its lifetime, especially with plutonium source aboard for power, which could give us 17 years worth of power, um, it'll be limited only by the mechanisms themselves. And, and what is the protection that it has against uh, severe dust storms, like we read about in the early 1970s, uh, when, the, when the mariners came, the, the planet was invisible. It was not visible. Uh, MSL is in pretty good shape because of the power source, uh, but we also, uh, you know, like point cameras down at the ground and things like that to try to keep them from being covered with dirt and with dust. Uh, some of the inlet ports for the uh, scientific instruments um, were, you know, we have to worry about dust buildup on those, but uh, hopefully we'll have some cleaning events there as well. So. Okay, thank you. I have you. time for one last question. I'll take that back microphone. Well, we're, we're back to the, uh, the sky crane for a moment. Okay. Uh, it is e intriguing. <laughs> every time you land on Mars, you land with a different landing system, it seems. So it, is the, the Mars Exploration Program really a covert program for demonstrating various landing systems? <laughs> less, less facetiously. The, the, uh, the, Mar the Mars Landing Program, yeah, got it. Okay. Yeah. Less There's facetious. actually a good answer for that. Yeah. Have you... Have you uh, 
finally settled on, on a, a, an end stage design, and is this it, or uh, will you be demonstrating new landing systems on future vehicles? And isn't it a little bit risky to go to a different system every time you land? Right. Um, let's see. So Pathfinder and MER were the same landing system. They were both airbag designed uh, and almost identical, very, very similar. Phoenix, which was a soft lander, was the same design, unfortunately, or fortunately, as Polar Lander, same system. Uh, in fact, Phoenix was built to be launched in 2001, but when Polar Lander crashed, uh, and we're still not exactly sure how, but when Polar Lander crashed, it was taken off of the mission. So that was exactly the same landing system. So we don't invent a new one every time. We try to use what we've invented. Now, MSL was a little different because the intent behind the MSL landing system design uh, was to put a metric ton on the surface. And, and there's two issues with this. Number one, um, a metric ton, we have not yet thought of any science requirements that would require a system that uh, would be heavier than a metric ton. MSL landing system was built with that in mind as a workhorse for the future, the intent. And so we've done design work for like uh, sample caching rovers and the launch vehicle that would launch a sample back into orbit and bars and things, designed around a one metric ton landing capability. All the documentation, the drawings, the, uh, the test procedures and everything has all been configuration managed during the build of MSL so that we could actually rebuild it if we wanted to. That has not been done before. So that all w has been impounded by the program as we went along. So our intent, at least robotically, is this is as much as we should be able to need. This is as much as we should need a metric ton to the surface. And that system is what, as long as it works, knock on wood, right, um, is, is the system that will give it to us. Now, where we get into some really crazy territory is, uh, is getting humans to Mars. We're not talking a metric ton. We're talking 20 or 30 metric tons. And then all of this is out the window. I, I didn't, because it's a little too technical, put a, put a diagram in that shows you in the, in the energetics curve versus mass, um, where we're just down right now, a little corner of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the chart. And human scale systems are not yet understood as far as how to do that. So that's a territory where we actually aren't quite sure how to do that yet. So, but if this works, you're going to stick with it, you think, from this point forward? That's the plan. That's the intent. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. And I'm sure that um, in the few minutes before our next session, and I'm sorry if we cut off any questions there, uh, it's always the art of trying to keep a program moving, but there is the opportunity, I'm sure, to have some private questions up front here. Um, so please take that opportunity, and thanks again to Doug for an outstanding presentation, and it's exciting to think of what's happening now and what's, what's coming not too far ahead. So let's take a very quick break, maybe a five to ten minute break, and we need to restart by no later than 10.15, so uh, we'll see you back in the room then. Thank you. Thank you.